Honourable members, honourable senators, the Speaker of the House of Representatives and the President of the Senate. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament. Direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite members to take their seats. Order. When the House has come to order, allow me on behalf of the House to extend a particular welcome to the President of the Senate and honourable senators to this meeting of the House of Representatives and the Senate in this chamber to hear the address by the President of the United States of America, the Honourable George W. Bush. Honourable members, honourable senators, the President of the United States of America. I invite members to resume their seats. Mr. President, I welcome you to the House of Representatives Chamber. 
Your address today to members and senators is indeed a significant occasion in the history of our federal parliament. I, I would like to welcome Mrs Laura Bush, who is in the gallery this morning. I would also like to acknowledge Dr Condoleezza Rice, Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and other senior officials from the United States who are in the gallery. Yeah. On behalf of the parliament, I extend a very warm welcome to our visitors. The Prime Minister. Uh, Mr uh, Speaker, Mr uh, President of the Senate, today uh, we welcome a man we uh, honour an office, we recommit to an alliance, and we declare that above all of those things, common values between nations unite nations and peoples more than individuals or institutions. And the things that unite the Australian and American people are shared values. The belief that the individual is more important than the state, that strong families are a nation's greatest asset, that competitive free enterprise is the ultimate foundation of national wealth, and that the worth of a person is determined by that person's character and hard work, not by that person's religion or race or colour or creed or social background. Our two nations, that is the United States and Australia, Mr Speaker, have fought in defence of those values, beginning, appropriately enough, on the 4th of July 1918 in the Battle of Hamel, when Australians and Americans first fought together, on America's National Day, but I might note under the command of an Australian, Sir John Monash, and uh, on subsequent occasions in defence of our common values. And I know that I speak for every Australian in this gathering today in saying that we will never forget the vital help extended to us in World War II in the Battle of the Coral Sea and on other occasions. And that United States intervention stood between us and potential military conquest. And it's something that the Australian people, whatever their different views may be on other issues, will never forget. Mr Speaker, the President of the United States and I first met face to face on the 10th of September 2001. And as we celebrated at the Naval Dockyard in Washington, the shared partnership of the ANZUS Alliance, neither of us knew what lay ahead. And the next day the world did change and we saw arising out of those events the character and the strength and the leadership of the man we welcome today. George Bush, the 30, 43rd President of the United States, rallied his own people and the people of the world in the fight against terrorism. And he reminded us then, as we should be reminded today, the terrorists oppose nations such as the United States and Australia not because of what we have done, but because of who we are and because of the values that we hold in common. And the terrorism, and we should remind ourselves of this again and again, is as much the enemy of Islam as it is the enemy of Judaism or Christianity. Mr Speaker, this is a robust parliament. It has seen debates and divisions of view on issues. We had a divided view in this nation on the question of our participation in Iraq. Let me simply state on behalf of the government that we believe the right decision was taken. We believe Australia was right to join the United States. And I know that all Australians believe that the people of Iraq are better off without that loathsome dictator Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I've spoken briefly of the past and the present, but we share an even greater future. The significance of America to Australia will grow as the years go by, it will not diminish. And that is one of the driving forces behind our commitment 
to a free trade agreement. The contribution of the United States to regional stability and the partnership it will forge with our other friends in the region, such as China and Japan, will be increasingly important to our nation. For those and many other reasons, both as a friend, as an individual, and very importantly, as a standard bearer for the values that we hold in common, I have great pleasure, Mr Speaker and Mr Senate President, on behalf of the government, in welcoming George Bush, the 43rd President of the United States of America. Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr President, I join with the uh, Prime Minister in the most uh, warmest of welcomes to you and to Mrs Bush. It is a pleasure to have you in our country. We're especially pleased that you've uh, come to this country following the meeting of APEC, because it is with great pride that a great former Prime Minister of this country, Bob Hawke, was instrumental not only in getting APEC going, but insisting that for it to be effective, the United States needed to be involved. Your presence here today reminds us all that the partnership between our two great nations is broad, it's deep, it's many-sided, it's long-standing, and in its fundamentals, it's bipartisan. It's, above all, a partnership of peoples. It's something beyond political parties, and beyond administrations. More than 60 years ago, another great Labor Prime Minister, John Curtin, and a great American President, Franklin Roosevelt, forged that partnership together in the crucible of World War II. Curtin famously wrote in December 1941, Australia looks to America, free of any pangs to our traditional links or kinship with the United Kingdom. And it's altogether fitting today that we should reaffirm that alliance in a world of rapid change. But the Australia of 1941 has been transformed as Australia's standing in the world has been transformed. We now also look to the future in our own region as both a good friend and a good neighbour among the nations of Asia and the Pacific. And we also look to our future in terms of our deep and enduring support for the United Nations and the principles of the United Nations Charter, as we did in East Timor. But above all, Australia looks to itself, to the self-reliance of a proud, a free, a strong and an independent people. Now, the Australian perspective is bound to differ from time to time with the perspective of the United States. And of course, on occasions, friends do disagree, as we did on this side with you on the war in Iraq. Yeah. But such is the strength of our shared values, our interests, our principles, that those differences can enrich rather than diminish, they can strengthen rather than weaken, the partnership. Our commitment to the Alliance remains unshakable, as does our commitment to the war on terror. But friends must be honest with each other. Honesty is, after all, the foundation stone of that great Australian value, mateship. Mr President, the world has changed. But there remains an essential truth in Prime Minister Curtin's words 62 years ago. Australia still looks to America. A truth not just for Australia, but for democracies everywhere. It's a profound historic truth and which derives its power not from the might of America, but from the democratic promise upon which America was brought forth, conceived, and dedicated 227 years ago. The equal rights of all nations, 
respect for the opinions of all peoples and the idea that all men are created equal. These principles, taken together, form the true and imperishable basis of the promise of and the friendship between our two great nations. May they never perish from the face of the earth. Mr President, it is a pleasure and an honour for me to invite you to address assembled members and senators. Governor General Michael Jeffrey, Prime Minister John Howard, Speaker of the House, Leader of the Senate, Leader of the Opposition, Simon Creed, distinguished members of the House and the Senate, Premiers, members of the Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen. Laura and I are honored to be in the Commonwealth of Australia. I want to thank the Prime Minister for his invitation. I want to thank the members and senators for convening this session of the Parliament. I want to thank the people of Australia for a gracious welcome. Five months ago, your Prime Minister was a distinguished visitor of ours at, uh, in Crawford, Texas, at our ranch. You might remember that I called him a man of steel. That's Texan for fair dinkum. <laughs> Prime Minister John Howard is a leader of exceptional courage who exemplifies the finest qualities of one of the world's greatest democracies. Yeah. Proud to call him friend. Americans know Australia as a land of independent and enterprising and good-hearted people. We see something familiar here something we like. Australians are fair-minded and tolerant and easygoing. Yet in times of trouble and danger, Australians are the first to step forward to accept the hard duties and to fight bravely until the fighting is done. In a hundred years of experience, American soldiers have come to know the courage and good fellowship of the diggers at their side. We fought together in the Battle of Hamel, together in the Coral Sea, together in New Guinea, on the Korean Peninsula, in Vietnam, and in the War on Terror, once again, we're at each other's side. In this war, the Australian and American people have witnessed the methods of the enemy. We saw the scope of their hatred on September the 11th, 2001. We saw the depth of their cruelty on October the 12th, 2002. We saw destruction and grief. And we saw our duty. As free nations in peril, we must fight this enemy with all our strength. No country can live, live peacefully in a world that the terrorists would make for us. And no people are immune from the sudden violence that can come to an office building or an airplane or a nightclub or a city bus. Your nation and mine have known the shock and felt the sorrow and laid the dead to rest. And we refuse to live our lives at the mercy of murderers. Amen. The nature of the terrorist threat defines the strategy we are using to, to fight it. These committed killers will not be stopped by negotiations. They will not respond to reason. 
The terrorists cannot be appeased. They must be found, they must be fought, and they must be defeated. The terrorists hide and strike within free societies. So we're draining their funds, disrupting their plans, finding their leaders. The skilled work of Thai and Indonesia and other authorities in capturing the terrorists in Bali, suspected of planning the murders in Bali and other attacks, was a model of the determined campaign we are waging. The terrorists seek safe harbor to plot and to train. So we're holding the allies of terror to account. America, Australia, and other nations acted in Afghanistan to destroy the home base of Al Qaeda and rid that country of a terror regime. And the Afghan people, especially the Afghan women, do not miss the bullying and the beatings and the public executions at the hands of the Taliban. The terrorists hope to gain chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons, the means to match their hatred. So we're confronting outlaw regimes that aid terrorists, that pursue weapons of mass destruction, and that defy the demands of the world. America, Australia, and other na nations acted in Iraq to remove a grave and gathering danger instead of wishing and waiting while tragedy drew closer. Since the liberation of Iraq, we have discovered Saddam's clandestine network of biological laboratories, the design work on prohibited long-range missiles, his elaborate campaign to hide illegal weapons programs, Saddam Hussein spent years frustrating UN inspectors for a simple reason, because he was violating UN demands. And in the end, rather than surrender his programs and abandon his lies, he chose defiance and his own undoing. Who can possibly think that the world would be better off with Saddam Hussein still in power? Surely not the dissidents who would be in his prisons or end up in his mass graves. Surely not the men and women who would fill Saddam's torture chambers and rape rooms. Surely not the families of the victims he murdered with poison gas. Surely not anyone who cares about human rights and democracy and stability in the Middle East. Today, Saddam's regime is gone, and no one. Senator Brown, I warn you. Senator Brown will excuse himself from the House. Senator Brown will excuse himself from the House. The sergeant will remove Senator Brown from the House. Surely no one President. who cares about human rights and democracy and stability in the Middle East. Today, Saddam Hussein's regime is gone, and no one should mourn its passing. In the months leading up to our action in Iraq, Australia and America went to the United Nations. We are committed to multilateral institutions because global threats require a global response. We're committed to collective security. And collective security requires more than solemn discussions and sternly worded pronouncements. It requires collective will. If the resolutions of the world are to be more than ink on paper, they must be enforced. If the institutions of the world are to be more than debating societies, they must eventually act. If the world promises serious consequences for the defiance of the lawless, then serious consequences must follow. Because we enforced Resolution 1441, 
and used force in Iraq as a last resort. There is one more free nation in the world, and all free nations are more secure. We accepted our obligations with open eyes, mindful of the sacrifices that had been made and those to come. The burdens fall most heavily on the men and women of our armed forces and their families. The world has seen the bravery and skill of the Australian military. Your special operations forces were among the first units on the ground in Iraq. And in Afghanistan, the first casualty among America's allies was Australian Special Air Service Sergeant Andrew Russell. This afternoon, I will lay a wreath at the Australian War Memorial in memory of Sergeant Russell and the long line of Australians who have died in the service to this nation. And my nation honors their service to the cause of freedom, to the cause we share. Members and senators, with decisive victories behind us, we have decisive days ahead. We cannot let up on our offensive against terror, even a bit. And we must continue to build stability and peace in the Middle East and Asia as the alternatives to hatred and fear. We seek the rise of freedom and self-government in Afghanistan and in Iraq for the benefit of their people. As an example to their neighbors and for the security of the world. America and Australia are helping the people of both those nations to defend themselves, to build the institutions of law and democracy, and to establish the beginnings of free enterprise. These are difficult tasks in civil societies wrecked by years of tyranny. And it should surprise no one that the remnants and advocates of tyranny should fight liberty's advance. The advance of liberty will not be halted. The terrorists and the Taliban and Saddam holdouts are desperately trying to stop our progress. They will fail. The people of Afghanistan and Iraq measure progress every day. They are losing the habits of fear, and they are gaining the habits of freedom. Some are skeptical about the prospects for democracy in the Middle East and wonder if its culture can support free institutions. In fact, freedom has always had its skeptics. Some doubted that Japan and other Asian countries could ever adopt the ways of self-government. The same doubts have been heard at various times about Germans and Africans. At the time of the Magna Carta, the English were not considered the most promising recruits for democracy. <laughs> And to be honest, sophisticated observers had serious reservations about the scruffy travelers who founded our two countries. <laughs> Every milestone of liberty was considered impossible before it was achieved. In our time, we must decide our own belief. Either freedom is the privilege of an elite few, or it is the right and capacity of all humanity. By serving our ideals, we also serve our interests. If the Middle East remains a place of anger and hopelessness and incitement, this world will tend toward division and chaos and violence. Only the spread of freedom and hope in the Middle East in the long term will bring peace to that region and beyond. And the liberation of more than 50 million Iraqis and Afghans from tyranny is progress to be proud of. Our nations must also confront the immediate threat of proliferation. We cannot allow the growing ties of trade and the forces of globalization to be used for the secret transport of lethal materials. So our two countries are joining together in the Proliferation Security Initiative. We're preparing to search planes and ships and trains and trucks carrying suspect cargo to seize weapons or missile shipments that raise proliferation concerns. Last month, Australia hosted the first maritime interdiction exercise in the Coral Sea. Australia and the United States are also keeping pressure on Iran 
to conform to its letter and the spirit of the non-proliferation obligations. We're working together to convince North Korea that the continued pursuit of nuclear weapons will bring only further isolation. The wrong weapons, the wrong technology, in the wrong hands has never been so great a danger, and we are meeting that danger together. Our nations have a special responsibility throughout the Pacific to help keep the peace, to ensure the free movement of people and capital and information, and advance the ideals of democracy and freedom. America will continue to maintain a foreign presence in Asia, and continue to work closely with Australia. Today, America and Australia are working with Japan and the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, and Singapore and other nations to expand trade and to fight terror, to keep the peace and the peace in the Taiwan Straits. Your country is hosting President Hu Jintao. Australia's agenda with China is the same as my country's. We're encouraged by China's cooperation in the war on terror. We're working with China to ensure the Korean Peninsula is free of nuclear weapons. We see a China that is stable and prosperous, a nation that respects the peace of its neighbors and works to secure the freedom of its own people. Security in the Asia-Pacific region will always depend on the willingness of nations to take responsibility for their neighborhood, as Australia is doing. Your service and your sacrifice helped to establish a new government and a new nation in East Timor. And working with New Zealand and other Pacific Island states, you're helping the Solomon Islands reestablish order and build a just government. By your principled actions, Australia is leading the way to peace in Southeast Asia, and America is grateful. Together, together my country, with Australia is promoting greater economic opportunity. Our nations are now working to complete a U.S.-Australia free trade agreement that will add momentum to the free trade throughout the Asian Pacific region while producing jobs in our own countries. We must know first will resume her seat. Sergeant will remove Senator Nettle. Senator Nettle will resume her seat. The President has the call. Senator Nettle is warned. Sergeant will remove Senator Nettle. I love the free President. speech. <laughs> the relationship the between America and Australia is vibrant and vital. Together, we will meet the challenges and the perils of our own time. In the desperate hours of another time, when the Philippines were on the verge of falling and your country faced the prospect of invasion, General Douglas MacArthur addressed members of the Australian Parliament. He spoke of a code that unites our two nations, the code of free people, which he said embraces the things that are right and condemns the things that are wrong. More than 60 years later, that code still guides us. We call evil by its name and stand for freedom that leads to peace. Our alliance is strong. We value more than ever the unbroken friendship between the Australian and the American peoples. My country is grateful to you and to all the Australian people for your clear vision and for your strength of heart. And I thank you for your hospitality. May God bless you all.
that. Ora Ora on behalf of the house may I extend to the president on on behalf of all senators and members our thanks for his address and may I wish he and Mrs Bush a very pleasant and successful time here in Australia. Yeah. Order. I'd remind members that I have not as yet adjourned the House. I invite senators and members to take their seats. Order. Before I adjourn the House, all senators and members will be well aware that under the standing orders, both Senators Brown and Nettle will leave me no choice but to name them. Oh, Having yeah. defied the Chair, Senators Net Brown and Nettle are therefore named. Yeah. The Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, I move that Senators Brown and Nettle be suspended from the oh, service of the House. Yeah. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. aye. Country no. I think the ayes have it. Senators Brown and Nettle are suspended from the service of the House. Order. I, thank, I thank members and senators for their attendance. I advise member for Batman. I advise that refreshments are now available in the Great Hall for members, senators and their guests. The House stands adjourned until tomorrow at 10 a.m. And I hereby declare this meeting of the House of Representatives and the Senate concluded.